playing regular batteries, which contributes to the problem, <laughs> right? Okay. But I know. Okay. Oh, okay, to save the world. Okay. Okay, so cognitive dissonance. Um, we're going to talk about, this is one of my favorite topics, because uh, I think it applies so widely. We can really apply it to a number of, of, of things we see in the world. Um, and it, it grew out of this idea. Um, what, was, what was going on is uh, behaviorism was huge, right? It's the 1950s, 1960s. And, uh, you know, Skinner basically, he wanted to couch uh, psychology in the sciences. And to do that, he felt like we can't be uh, messing around with these intangible things like thoughts and emotions, because you can't measure them. However, we can measure behavior. And if we want to be considered a serious science, like the other sciences, then we need to just focus on behavior because it's easy to measure. And so really, the whole field of psychology was basically behaviorism in the 50s and 60s. If you weren't a behaviorist, you were a flaky psycho analyst, and you were doing something over there, and people didn't consider it science. So um, this was great in the sense that it got us, you know, kind of a foot in the door in terms of uh, being taken seriously as a discipline. Um, but, you know, the, the basic premise here is that rewards and punishments uh, basically uh, can explain behavior. I know what you're going to do. I can predict what you're going to do uh, based on what happened after you behaved, okay? Um, so what's what's strange, and I think this came up earlier this semester. Um, I don't remember the context, but there's this person, uh, and I, I believe he lived in Texas, and he uh, thought he had received a message from God. Um, this is reminding me of Heaven's Gate. That was the conversation that we were having. Um, but the idea is that, uh, look, there's going to be this flood uh, on Earth, and uh, we're going to be rescued by aliens. And, uh, you know, God told me this in a dream. Um, and this person, by the way, is an academic, uh, a doctor who, who received this message. And uh, after he, he sort of let everybody know about it. You know, he went to the local newspaper. He went to anybody who would listen and say, you know, and basically said, look, we're in danger. You know, you need to kind of uh, follow me and we're all going to be at a meeting point and we have to do things to prepare for when the aliens come to pick us up. Um, well, the guy lost his job and uh, people were ridiculing him. He uh, kind of became uh, a laughing stock of the, you know, where he lived. Um, and what's interesting is he still managed to get followers. He went, he went further. He tried to spread the word further. He went nationally. Um, you know, and from a behaviorist point of view, if you're Skinner, you're looking at this and going, wait a minute, right? Because he's not getting approval. He's not receiving social approval. He's not receiving rewards. Dude lost his job. These are all punishments. People are making fun of it. Why does he keep going further? Like, how does that make sense? So, uh, Leon Festinger um, is sort of, you know, this is about 1962. He starts, he publishes this paper on, on cognitive dissonance, and he says, basically, first, we can't just rely on behaviorism. It doesn't explain weird things that people do, and people do weird things, and, and we can't just understand them by looking at what happens after that behavior, because some people can be punished and punished and punished, and then continue uh, behaving in the same way. So he suggested that there are, uh, there's this dissonance that occurs between our cognitions and our behavior, um, what he's calling cognitive dissonance. And the, Example here is uh, you have this thought that hamburgers are delicious, um, but 
you also know that eating beef is sort of an inefficient way to transport energy and you're an environmentalist, right? So you care about the environment, but you also have this uh, idea that hamburgers are really delicious and you like to eat meat. And these uh, cognitions are sort of in conflict with one another. So what are you gonna do, you know? Um, you might have consonant thoughts. So maybe if you, if you like, um, to save money, you might say, well, beef is a bit cheaper than tofu, so I'm doing good there. Um, and then, you know, of course, we can have irrelevant thoughts. But here's the, the idea is that we have these, these dissonant thoughts, and uh, best standard thoughts have just caused anxiety and tension. And so, you know, when we filled the uh, paper out, some of us said we kind of felt shitty. That was what uh, Festinger would have predicted, is that you kind of feel bad about doing things that are inconsistent with your uh, beliefs. And really, these cognitions can be anything. So they can be beliefs, they can be ideas about the self. Um, just whenever there's either inconsistent thoughts and particularly uh, thoughts that are inconsistent with your behavior, that it causes this tension um, and that you're motivated to relieve that tension in some way. So we can think about a lot of different things, you know, when we're trying to make a decision about what to buy, we might experience dissonance. Um, you know, drinking and driving, if you uh, know that that's dangerous, but you do it anyway. Um, maybe how you spend your time, time management, might be an issue where you have dissonant thoughts. Um, importantly, we can, we can apply this to things like prejudice, too. So, um, really, this idea of cognitive dissonance and this desire to relieve the tension between two things that are inconsistent can really be applied to a lot of situations. That's why I, I think I like this theory so much, is because it really helps explain people's behavior. Festinger um, kind of got to this idea of the self. Um, to be in the world and we have an ought self that's really influenced by our social relationships usually um, although the ought self can also be determined by stuff like the media you know so you might look at a uh, picture of a gorgeous uh, human being and you go oh I want to look like that human being I want to gain weight or lose weight or change my hair uh, but the ought self oftentimes you know this is kind of thought like the super ego or like your parents or uh, important relationships in your life, people telling you, you ought to do this, you ought to do that. So whenever there's a discrepancy between who we are and who we think we ought to be, we also experience this cognitive dissonance, this, this tension um, that, again, we have to relieve in some way. Um, some people take, take cognitive dissonance so far as to say that this is really the root of mental illness are these discrepancies between who we see ourselves as uh, and who we, who we uh, actually are. The theory suggests that we're gonna uh, have the most discomfort whenever there's a large number of dissonant beliefs. If the thought or belief is very important, you know, I had the example there of maybe choosing a, a school to go to if you're thinking about grad school or maybe choosing a career path. Um, or choosing a job, you know, these, these are really important things that might cause you a lot of discomfort, um, particularly when there's a lot of options. Um, and particularly when the alternatives are equally attractive. And so some people get plagued by this and they have hard, a hard time making decisions in their life because 
uh, they, they feel uh, so much dissonance because of equally att attractive options. You know, if you've ever seen somebody standing in an aisle at Target, like, you know, just blankly staring, like, what am I going to do with this toothbrush or that one? Ah! So, um, let's say I have two incompatible thoughts. Uh, what do you think I can do to make myself feel better? And here's an example. Um, drinking and driving is dangerous, but I just woke up this morning and realized that I drove home drunk last night. What do I do? I'm, I'm awake. I'm like, oh my God, what have I done? Any ideas? Good. So I can like minimize the neg. I can say, hey, look, it's a bright side. Nothing bad happened. No big deal. I can kind of decrease the importance of that idea of the belief that I can't drive drunk because, hey, look, I did and it was fine. So the plan will not do it again. Good. So I can actually make a plan. Say, I'm not going anywhere without my, I'd say $20 for a cab, but maybe make sure I have my, my phone and the Uber or Lyft or whatever. What else? You might blame somebody else and say, oh, well, it wasn't my fault if that person wouldn't have uh, drank too much. She was supposed to be the DD. I wouldn't be in this situation. So we, we do have some, uh, some options. The most obvious one is change the behavior. Of course, that's usually the hardest, right? It's, you know, thinking about environmental behaviors, um, you know, eating behaviors, all these kind of things. Uh, it's really hard to change a behavior, particularly one that you've kind of become habituated to. The other thing, you can just change the attitude or its importance and say, eh, you know, it is real important that I don't drink if I've had this many drinks, but if I've had fewer than that many drinks, then I'm cool. So maybe you kind of, you tweak your belief a little bit to fit your behavior. Um, and probably the most attractive option is to rationalize, right? So minimize the negative consequences, say, hey, nobody got hurt, it's fine, I'm, I'm home, it's cool. You might minimize your own responsibility and say, hey, it was somebody else's fault, you know, that's not going to happen again. Or just totally focus on the positives and ignore the negatives. Just kind of get them out of your mind. So, you know, the bottom line here is that we want to feel good about ourselves um, and we want to maintain sort of a positive, like a stable self-view. Um, and what's really important, people will go to really to, to, to links to ensure that they can consider themselves moral. You know, our own morality, our goodness is really important. Um, we're sort of being mentally healthy. And so we have to convince ourselves that we're good, even when we're bad. Um, or it, it feels better to rationalize bad behaviors. Um, and we also don't want to look foolish or second guess our decisions. So if I bought a car that was X amount of dollars and then I realized um, that I could have got a different car, I'll, I'll tell myself, you know, all the reasons why the choice I made was the best choice. Because it feels better. Okay. So uh, this is a demonstration of, of cognitive dissonance. Um, it was the peg turning study. Um, and this is kind of early research on uh, cognitive dissonance to see uh, if, you know, if these ideas were accurate. So suppose you volunteered to participate in an experiment and you were seated at a table and asked to undertake a series of meaningless tasks for about an hour. What students were told to do, there was a large board and they were supposed to take each, there was a peg, you know, holes and, and a peg, a, like 100 of them. And you're supposed to take the little blue thing and then like turn it so it faced a different way. And you do that for like an hour and you're just turning pegs. 
Um, so it's real boring. Uh, afterwards, the experimenter says, you know, do you mind telling everybody um, that you, you know, meet in the hallway, that it was really interesting and worthwhile? You know, please advertise our study to other folks and let them know you had a lot of fun. Um, you were paid either a dollar or twenty dollars to do this, and then you're asked privately to rate your enjoyment of the task on a question. So, after which amount, one or twenty, do you believe your actual enjoyment rate would be higher? Okay, so I'm going to ask you to uh, talk with your group for just a moment and uh, see see what y'all think. Try to come to a a consensus. I Okay, do y'all have an answer? We think it wouldn't matter. It wouldn't matter. Okay. Other answers. So you think if they, it, the, in this case, if you were in the $20 condition, you would rate your actual enjoyment higher than in the $1. Okay. Any other responses? Yeah. You gave me $20 for sharing to say we were talking about our income and stuff and like how much we get paid to work. Mm -hmm. And most of us like not even ten dollars, ten dollars at the most. So it would be like twenty dollars for an hour of work. Mm -hmm. so. Same back there? Yeah, okay. it's the same thing. So y'all are behaviorists. <laughs> right? Because uh, if you say twenty dollars, then you're saying it's based on reward, right? So if you get paid more, you should enjoy it more. Okay. <laughs> this is on a, a negative two to positive two scale. What do you think happens? I mean, I guess if they were handed the money, they wouldn't necessarily feel obligated to if they already had the money. And whereas if it was a dollar, they might feel more inclined to rate it accurately. Yeah, because they're doing this in private. So this is their actual, how much did you actually enjoy that task? Okay, and they're doing it in private. So there's none of that like sort of social desirability kind of stuff. Anyone have an explanation? I guess they were already rewarded with the twenty dollars, so maybe they just didn't feel as inclined to. Sure, sure, them. but then why would these people feel inclined? They're probably bored out of mind. <laughs> they might have thought it would be more after if they rated it higher. Hmm. Okay, so the way that Festinger explained these results is he said uh, people were asked to lie, lie to other people, <laughs> and if you're given. $20 to lie to other people, 
but it's justified, right? You go, you know, hey, I'm lying, but I was paid. So they were lying, trying to lie to themselves by raising their okay. tires so they would tell other people? Okay, so in the $20 condition, they had no reason to lie on the questionnaire and say, I enjoyed it. They're getting paid to do the lie. In this condition, however, there's not enough justification for them to lie to other folks about the enjoyment. So in order to justify that wrongdoing, they say, I actually liked it. Yeah. So rather than feel bad about lying, they said, hey, it was kind of enjoyable. Because they only got paid one dollar. So yeah, this is a little bit different. Let's let's try it uh, one more time. This is another study. It's called Fry Grasshoppers. Uh, students enter the lab and they're greeted by either a very friendly, cheerful, and fun researcher, or somebody who's rude, mean, and arrogant. And the researcher says, hey, uh, I need you to eat this fried grasshopper. By the way, this isn't like a freshly fried grasshopper. It's like, you know, they had it in the fridge overnight. I mean, it's cold, it's fried. I mean, maybe if it was hot, you'd be like, oh, do you have some ketchup? But no, it was like, <laughs> I don't know, something dip it in. <laughs> uh, but no, it was gross. Uh, afterwards, they're asked to rate their enjoyment of the grasshopper. Okay. Which group of students liked the grasshopper more? Those in the mean condition or the nice condition? Talk with your group for just a moment. See what you guys think. I went to a fancy restaurant once and crickets were on the salad. Well, so my, my girlfriend got salad and I was like, okay, I'll try a bite. It was gross. Oh, no. liking it so I don't I don't think there's anything strange I think it was in my head just thinking about insect legs okay what did we think which which group of students uh, liked it more Okay, why? I thought that like if you were the angry one and then you have an intimidating over very person, you might feel pressured to not get more negative feedback. So it's kind of like negative. Okay. But let's let's imagine again that they're doing this privately. So they're rating their their how much did you enjoy the grasshopper and nobody can see their ratings. It's gonna be anonymous. <laughs> Okay, all right. Y'all are on the right track. Any any other ideas? We thought we we went with that one because we like the stubbornness of someone rude. So we want to be not necessarily condescending, but prove them wrong with their mean. But then we also felt like if it's a nice person, like privately you might feel like fine, but you won't feel as bad because they wouldn't know. But you might feel the pressure to rate it well because you might think 
that's what they want you to do. Ah, mm, okay. So uh, y'all are right. They thought it was more delicious if there was a mean researcher, okay? But the way that Festinger described, you know, interpreted these results, is he say that there's a negative stimuli, right? It's something gross that you did, uh, you agreed to, and now you have to rationalize, justify. Why did I do that? Why did I eat something disgusting? Well, you can rationalize it pretty easily if you have a nice researcher. You go, well, I ate it because she asked me to, or he asked me to, and they were so pleasant, and um, how, how lovely. But in this condition, you don't have that ration, rationale, right? Like, you just did something gross. So you have to kind of justify to yourself why you did it. You think to yourself, well, it wasn't that bad. Because there's no way you did it for the mean person. Right. I mean, the other explanations that y'all came up with, they sound reasonable too. But uh, Festinger, of course, wants to interpret this in terms of justification, internal justification for uh, we want our behaviors and our cognitions to match. So uh, this has been applied to a lot of situations. Um, you know, people who are, have it really hard to get into groups. For example, like hazing, they express more uh, more enjoyment of those groups. So if it's really hard to get in, then you like it more. Um, what's interesting too is like you can. They did a study where they sort of manipulated how much money they were giving the kids to read books over the summer. And so in one condition, they gave kids. I'm going to give you. I, I don't remember exactly what the the amount was. Let's say a dollar versus ten cents. At the end of the summer. Uh, these kids were reading books and they asked the kids, well, how much did you enjoy reading this summer? Um, guess which group liked reading more? The 10 cents. They didn't, the, the people who were getting paid a dollar, they didn't have the justification to, I mean, they had the justification to read from this external source. They didn't have to justify it themselves. And so if you give, I mean, if you have kids, maybe you give them less if you want them to enjoy something, you know? Hey, I'll give you a penny if you do your homework tonight. I don't know. Um, they look at things like insufficient punishment. So uh, again, with you know, I don't know if this works with dogs, but I think it works with people. Um, if people aren't, if they do something bad, but the, they don't feel like the punishment was sufficient for the crime, whatever they did. Um, then they have to justify what to themselves why they would stop. And so people can people say that this could be applied to situations like uh, beating up on one's brother, right? Instead of uh, extolling a very harsh punishment to the kid who started the fight, maybe you give them a slap on the hand. And then when they stop, they have to justify it to themselves. Why did I do this? Although I was only slapped on the hand, for example. Uh, I think the book talks about the Ben Franklin effect, which is kind of funny. They, they say uh, if you want somebody to like you, ask them to do something for you, which is kind of silly. But the idea being that like um, if people don't have uh, sufficient justification for helping another person, they might blame it on uh, liking the person. So, you know, if you have a crush on somebody, maybe you say, hey, can you give me a ride? I need, or, you know, hey, can you give me five bucks or, uh, or something, you know, but then they have to say, well, why did I, why did I give that person a ride? Oh, well, actually, they're very pleasant. I enjoy that person's company. Yeah. Um, they've also done research on inevitability. And when people feel like something is going to happen, regardless of their own behavior, um, they end up liking it more. So uh, I put Brussels sprouts here because, again, I'm thinking about kids, you know, you better eat those Brussels sprouts, you know, I'm going to serve them every night for the next 10 nights because maybe they're in the garden or whatever. Uh, and, and if you have to do it, you might start to like it because there's no other option. Uh, there's been a lot of research on decisions that people make, and uh, it turns out that once people make a decision, they tend to like whatever decision they made better than the alternatives. 
And again, this has to do with that rationalization. You have to tell yourself, why did I make this choice versus the other one? And they've done this in the lab by asking people to uh, rate how much something costs uh, before or after they're, they're asked to make a choice. So they come into the, the lab and there's a bunch of items on the uh, on the desk and they, uh, they say, you can take one of these items home. Decide which one you'd like, you know, so it's mugs and, you know, whatever, blenders, toasters. Um, and they're either asked to rate how much they think that thing is worth before or after. And they realize that uh, what they see is that people rate it higher if they've made the choice. So a blender that you might, if you didn't choose it, you say, oh, that's $10. After you choose it, you go, oh, that was 15 for sure. You increase the value in your head. Um, it's the same with like if you ever go to a garage sale, you know, people feel like, you know, you see those high prices. It's like, well, because I chose that. I chose that item, so it's worth a lot more in my eyes. Um, we can also apply this to the idea that we, you know, seek out information that maintains our own beliefs and attitudes. Again, because we want to feel like we're smart, uh, that we make, you know, we make good choices. Um, and so it, it makes sense that we would sort of try to limit the amount of information that uh, is inconsistent with our beliefs. So um, why did, so I, I think I, I started to tell you that people joined Dr. Armstrong, um, this guy who uh, thought that aliens were going to come and pick him up. And he actually, they a bunch of people like sold their homes and got ready to leave, you know, and they all met at a place uh, and a specific date, you know, came and went. And the followers, they were even more uh, invested after the aliens didn't show up. Um, why is this? From a cognitive dissonance point of view, why would, why would uh, people be committed to this this thing. Good. Right. Good. Right. Yes. So it's 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 that self image, that self concept. We don't want to look stupid. We don't want to look immoral. We want to feel good about ourselves, and to do that, sometimes that means we have to double down on things that, uh, on our beliefs and our attitudes. Um, and so the same is, is true of, you know, we, we can really think about cult behavior or, you know, group behavior when you see groups doing really crazy things. It's it, partly it's because it's really hard to, to, to uh, sort of fess up to yourself cognitively and say, you know, I made a mistake, uh, particularly once you invest. So people who sold their homes, people who gave away their things, uh, there's even more reason to sort of double down. Um, you know, people do uh, sort of uh, point out weaknesses or limitations of the theory. It's not always clear when people are going to use the different mechanisms to minimize tension, right? So when, when is somebody going to change their behavior versus rationalize it? Um, that's not always clear. Um, so, so, Hmm. Um, okay, so it is 2.45. We have 30 minutes. Uh, I guess I can start talking about um, 